Okay, I think we're good to go. Uh, welcome everyone to the Stan Student Festival 2020. Um, we are delighted this year to have moved the festival online. Um, and the theme this year is climate enforced migration. So what we're really trying to do is raise awareness among students of I suppose the issues around climate change and migration and how they're interlinked and how they impact communities around the world. Um, so my name is Joanne, I should say as well, and I work with STAND um, and we engage third level students throughout the year on global justice issues. So if this is your first time engaging with the festival, well, a, a very warm welcome to you. And if it's not, it's great to have you back here with us tonight. So this uh, particular event is really focused around media representations of climate migrants and how the media, I suppose, perceives climate change and migration and um, all the, um, I suppose, complex issues that come with that. So we have a really great lineup of uh, speakers this evening and I'm very excited to see how the conversation unfolds. Um, before I hand over to uh, Sirka, our moderator, just to let you know that, we will have a kind of Q&A section uh, towards the end of the event. So if you have any questions or comments that you would like to share with the panelists, please feel free to pop them into the chat box. We'll be keeping an eye on that during the event. Um, so I'm really delighted to introduce you to our moderator, Sirka. Sirka Pollock has been a journalist uh, with the Irish Times and she focuses on um, migration and social justice issues. And she has a really incredible book, New to the Parish, that I read back in 2018. And it's a really incredible book um, and I would highly recommend everybody reading it at some point. But anyway, I'll hand it over to Sirka if you want to take it away. Thanks very much, Joanne. Yeah, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in this evening from your homes, wherever you are. Um, we've got an amazing lineup of speakers uh, today. I think, um, as Joanne pointed out just before we started, one of the, obviously there's many negatives associated with COVID, but one of the positives is that um, we get to speak to people halfway across the world. And we've got speakers in um, on the west coast of the States, near San Francisco, LA, and we've also got someone in Paris this evening. I'm in Dublin, which isn't so exciting. So uh, it looks, I think we're gonna have a really great discussion discussion um, focusing, as John pointed out, on the media representation of climate migrants, which is a huge topic, but the three people here tonight have a lot to speak about on this. So um, just to give you a little bit of introduction and background, our uh, first of all, we have Abraham Lusgarten. He's a senior environmental reporter with a focus on business, climate and energy. He currently works as a senior reporter for ProPublica and frequently works with the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic and PBS Frontline. Now, I actually, before um, doing this event earlier this week, I was reading this and really, I highly recommend Abraham's recent piece, uh, The Great Climate Migration which is a long read, a detailed read, but really insightful into how what is happening around climate migration in different parts of the world, specifically in this article focusing on the Central America and Mexico. And um, so he's done some really fascinating work. He's also, um, he co-produced the 2016 Discovery Channel film, Killing the Colorado, which was a finalist for the 2016 uh, Pulitzer Prize. So um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, then we also have- Thanks for having thank me. Thank you. We've got Alexandra Tempus. Alexandra writes on place, belonging and climate change. Her work has appeared in Rolling Stone the Guardian, Orion, The Nation, Progressive, High Country News, and in other places. She's a three-time climate reporting fellow and was a lead researcher on one of my favorite books, actually, Naomi Klein's bestseller, This Changes Everything. Um, and she's a contributor to a book on environmental justice activism, which is coming from, which is due to come out from the new press, and is a staff writer at the independent investigative outlet, Fair Warning. And I really like, in her own personal bio on her website, how she described that she's telling stories from communities within the United States that are uprooted by and adapting to climate change. I think it's something that um, many people in the Western world often think, oh, well, that's people very far away from me who, and I'm not deep, directly affected by it. But if you look at some of Alexandra's work, which I was looking back on, uh, she's that brilliant piece recently in the Rolling Stones, which looks specifically at American communities who have been deeply affected by uh, climate by climate change so um, she's done some brilliant work around this and our third speaker is Sarah Kreta. Sarah is a visual journalist and Marie Curie research fellow at Dublin City University. Uh, she's extensive experience investigating human rights abuses and over the past few years she has reported from Nigeria, Sudan, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, the DRC, Libya, Chad, Cameroon, Morocco, Morocco, Tunisia, the Gaza Strip, and on a rescue ship in the Mediterranean. So 
she's been in some pretty, uh, excuse the pun, hot spots for climate change, really following it on the ground. She has an academic background in international cooperation and protection of human rights. And she focuses much of her work on how dissident actors use internet technologies in affecting political action vis-a-vis -vis the Horn of Africa region and politics. And she also has a real emphasis on the human struggle in her work. She documents, as you can see from the places she's worked from, on the ground conditions when uh, in forced migration situations. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, three um, really wide and varied careers that we're gonna be able to bring into this discussion. So, um, I mean, I've given some background on your work, but I suppose the first question I'd like to ask you all is what draws you to this specific type of migration? Um, and why do you feel the need to be disseminating and spreading this information through your writing, through your um, through your videos, all those different media. So Abram, I'll put that question to you first. Sure, I mean, um, I would take a step back and say, you know, I cover climate, uh, climate change. And, you know, if you try to break down the issue of climate change and how it's going to, to affect our world and change our lives, you know, there's only a couple um, kind of big compartments or silos that that issue falls into. Um, you look at how it'll affect biodiversity and you look at how it'll affect, you know, weather uh, and, and agriculture and um, things like that. But I found, you know, pretty quickly in, in my research that how it affects where people live, the geography of, of the planet's one of the, the largest kind of categories of, of issues to look at. And so um, it's not so much, you know, from my perspective that I was focused on migration and finding a climate angle as much as looking at climate and finding that the way that it will uh, change, reorganize, displace, encourage movement of, of people on a very large scale, um, I believe, you know, will be one of the, the most significant ways that uh, the planet experiences climate change. And so uh, come at it that way. Okay. And um, Alexandra, can I put the same question to you? What's, I mean, I, I was from looking at your piece, that, and as I've already said, you're very focused on what's happening internally in the US, which I think is hugely important. I don't think we're talking about it enough here in Ireland. Can you tell me a bit about what attracted that, you to that? Sure. Well, um, I, uh, you know, I really, I was interested in climate issues, um, covering things in, on environmental issues and climate in college. I know we're speaking to university students today, so I encourage you to follow that path if you're interested in it. So I was reporting on that as a student, but then I think I really got into the work that I'm doing now after working with Naomi Klein on her book, This Changes Everything. Um, you know, once the book wrapped up, um, that was sort of like a <laughs> master's program and learning about sort of the economic and social implications of climate change. So when it was done, I sort of returned to reporting. And, um, you know, this was like six years ago and stories then were just starting to emerge around, you know, climate migration was, you know, it was, it was starting to become part of the, you know, popular discourse. But um, a lot of the stories were about folks from, you know, South Asia or tiny Pacific Island nations. And, you know, I was freelancing. I didn't have funding to go and tell those stories, but I was also just really curious about um, how this phenomenon was unfolding you know, in my own country. Um, and, you know, as I went to different communities, I saw folks who were, you know, dealing with and responding to climate change impacts on the ground. And that, that was what always really interested me the most about, about the climate change story. Um, and, you know, sort of over time, I saw that a lot of people were responding by moving, you know, they were relocating. And, um, you know, so there's been quite a lot of coverage of relocation, of managed retreat, of, um, you know, home buyout programs, things like that. But, you know, not a lot of discussion about framing that as a form of migration. So um, that that's kind of where I, uh, you know, started. Um, that was my entry point into this. And then, uh, you know, uh, so I've ended up reporting from places like Staten Island. There were internally displaced people from Louisiana that moved to uh, after Katrina to Houston um, and organized as IDPs in Houston, which is interesting. Um, you know, rural communities in Wisconsin uh, that, you know, Fasten is sort of one of the birthplaces of a community relocation programs was in my home state of Wisconsin. So um, that was really, um, really interesting. So yeah, I, um, the more I got into it, the more I started seeing common patterns and um, and really seeing this this story of internal migration come together. And 
and then um, I, you know, last year I was lucky enough to have a, a fellowship that supported me to take a trip to Belgium to talk to some of the top experts on environmental migration. And um, that was super fascinating because I, I really learned um, that it's not always a straightforward or clear cut phenomenon. There's a lot of interlocking factors that um, that play into migration and, and we still don't really have a common language to talk about it. So anyway, out of that trip and out of that um, reporting came my Rolling Stone piece and um, you know, and, and, you know, trying to tr attempt to reframe uh, or define a little bit more about how we think about climate migration. But anyway, that's, that's how I got into this work. Great, thanks. Sarah, um, I imagine with you, it was more the migration migrant aspect that brought you into the climate based on the places that you've reported on. I know the work that you've done from some of those countries and um, a lot of it is around human rights violations, which does tie in with climate justice. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your connected to the climate migrant story? Yeah, exactly. I think my work with displacement uh, started at the EU border and uh, how we speak about refugees and migrants also arriving to Europe. And I start to also question myself in the language that we use and in the way that we portray uh, others, uh, in the sense that uh, we find ourselves as journalists in the middle of this uh, biggest wave of displacement that was on our step door and in the so-called refugee crisis and uh, suddenly all over around European media and, and so on, uh, we saw that there was a lot of question about refugees arriving to Europe and I constantly question myself about why there was so little attention to the context that refugees and migrants were fleeing actually and uh, and that's where my stories also try to connect so the the story between new arrival but also war reporting and the story between refugees and international news but also the story from their country of origin um, and again I try to challenge this language of um, of invasion and a huge wave or suddenly everyone it becomes unbearable and uh, and we, we I try to put um, in the center the story uh, the story of um, people that I met uh, and I hope that this can also help us to, to get away of this fiduciary attitude and uh, and get away from the just the idea of, uh, of numbers and and so on I also question a lot in my reporting this idea of uh, humanitarianism and uh, and also this idea of the politics that we live um, and the, the fact that some life are worth protection while other uh, are so obsolete and disposable and again you know i try to look at also the the narratives of walls and uh, anxiety and these unwanted consequences uh, uh, about security borders and and so on so i try really to challenge uh, and to depoliticize again the individuals um because i believe individuals have also the ability to decide about their own life is not just about displacement is not just about this aesthetic of sufferance, uh, but there is also the politic behind this politic of pity, I think, behind this practice of consumerism. Uh, we need to move away and uh, we need also to challenge this in our reporting and, um, you know, try to challenge and uh, move uh, into the, the social question as well. The long term, uh, the, 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 the establishment structure of justice um, and so on. So that's how, you know, as a journalist, I see myself trying also to, with my work, to influence policy, but also to push government to, to do more, to avoid risk of further displacement, but also, you know, uh, being able to, to inform policies and policy maker. So, yeah, I think this important, uh, it's an important discussion today uh, because, yeah, we, we need to think about the way we represent and we investigate the political route of displacement. Um, because again, a lot of this, this situation that I've been in around the world um, remain protected and complex, but there is something that is important to mention that is the, the political dynamic uh, and uh, how much the political is also part of this conflict. So that's why I think through my reporting, I try to address this and I try to go behind this politic of pity and, and this practice of, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, you've all raised extremely interesting points there that I'd like to touch on. And um, just to jump back, something that Alexander said that um, stay with me is that this is something that's really only come to the forefront 
in the last, let's say, five or six years, which is quite true. I mean, there's a lot of people who've been writing about this for a long time, academics who've been researching it, but interest in it um, has, I suppose it started to peak when climate issues started to hit more Western countries. I think people became more conscious of it. Um, and as I just want to, something that Abram said in his piece in the um, New York Times magazine, which really struck me, was that this um, coronavirus pandemic has kind of offered a test run on whether humanity has the capacity to avert a predictable and predicted catastrophe. This is a predictable catastrophe. We all know it's coming. Um, but how do we, how, 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 should, how should people learn about this? How should they know about it? Um, I suppose the humanity question, Avram, I'll start with you because your 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 piece that I read really goes into the human stories. And I suppose that's what all journalists are trying to do. They're trying to bring the humanity out from the figures. But um, and you really focused on on Central um, America. You know, you start with Guatemala, you work through El Salvador and then up to Mexico. Um, how much do you think that works? Is there a level of apathy that it, that people just feel this is inevitable, it's going to happen? Or that do, do people respond to those stories of people who are far away, who whose lives have been destroyed by what's happened so far? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. It's uh, and difficult to answer. I mean, I think as as Alexandra mentioned, I mean, there's, there's um, a recognition of the different pieces that fit together into this climate and migration puzzle but but really hasn't been until now maybe a recognition of of what those you know puzzle pieces fit together uh to to show and what that you know what that is is this larger picture of a mass movement of of people around the world and so you know um so that's new still and i i think it's even newer than five or six years uh old i, I mean i i just don't think that there's been a really you know advanced conversation about the scale and the reach of of this as a as a challenge, um, maybe it's an opportunity. I try to try to steer away from you know framing it as a problem um, only. Um, I you know it's we we as media uh, you know I think we're always fighting headwinds of of apathy and climate in particular has been you know notoriously difficult to uh, communicate effectively around and and this is no different. And then on top of that, you know we we fit into patterns of always using um, kind of dramatic personal stories and anecdotes to. Uh, to frame or sensationalize or try to like hook people into to stories. And that's, you know, that's a danger here too. So navigating all of those <laughs> kind of thorny, thorny, um, you know, issues is, is challenging. Um, I mean, I found, so in, in the approach to the two stories that, that I've done on this so far, um, you know, one is more other was, you know, other from a United States perspective was, you know, foreign reporting and the other is more us, you know, focused on us in the United States. And, um, you know, for my reporting in Central America, it just tried to do, I think, what we all do, but since, you know, the issues have to be brought to life through people's personal experiences. Otherwise, it, you know, it's, you risk kind of just lecturing or, uh, you know, or overbearing with, you know, facts and figures. And, uh, you know, I think the trick is to do that in a way that it makes people relatable, um, but not, you know, uh, not sort of merely sort of targets for sympathy. And, you know, that's it. I don't know if that's effective or not, but, but my goal, you know, is to just bring these issues alive and to try to, um, you know, incite empathy in readers uh, through the relation of, you know, how actual people in Guatemala or El Salvador were experiencing the hardship that they're experiencing and, and maybe reframing, you know, here, the, the immigration debate is a really, you know, thorny and politicized one. And I think that there, you know, is a lot of negative attitudes towards who migrants are and what the reasons are that they move. And so I think there's some, some value in, in trying to show, um, you know, the real difficult hardships and the sort of family-based hardships that a lot of people face that everybody can relate to. Um, and I would just say, you know, I, in the United States, um, my, my focus was a little bit more on the decision-making process and that it's just something that um, I think people really connect with. Uh, so, so not the drama of what's happening to people or, or you know, tragedy and, and disaster, but, um, but the dilemma, uh, which is really how we're all going to face is this. And it's, um, sorry about that. It's, uh, 
it's a way that I think brings the issue alive because in, in small ways, big ways, I mean, not all of us have been forced out of a, you know, of a city by Hurricane Katrina, but maybe we all, you know, have our own kind of, um, you know, indecisions and ways in which, you know, the heat is getting to be too much, or we know somebody who, you know, uh, was affected by a wildfire or something like that. And, and um, uh, just focusing on that individual decision-making process, I think helps to bring this alive and, and helps readers connect with it a little bit. Sorry, forgot to unmute myself there. Yeah, and I think uh, particularly in the United States at the moment, because you've got the wildfires, um, I mean, burning out of control, you've got coastal erosion in so many places, as, as Alexandra pointed out in her work. And I think, um, I mean, in Ireland this morning, one of our cities is pretty much underwater. There's massive flooding down in Cork, and there seems to be just kind of the, the response of putting the Band-Aid on it and saying, just put some more sandbags in and we'll deal with it the next time. But I do think those moments brings it home to people in a way that it hadn't before. This is real. Cork is two, two hours from my door and um, that people can focus on it in a way that perhaps they didn't before. It's, it's the, the unfortunate world that we live in that we relate more to the people we can see directly in our lives. Um, Alexander, there was something that you mentioned in your work that really struck me though, is that over recent years, scientists and all extremely well-meaning scientists who, who dedicate their lives to this, focus on, on nailing this number, this global number of how many people are going to be affected by um, climate change. And there are, there are shocking numbers that are thrown around constantly. I have referred to them in my own work, but you're saying that there's a danger, that, that this, this, this can be problematic. It's conjuring, conjuring this kind of a, apocalyptic invasion of migrants arriving into your country, coming in thousands, millions of people arriving over borders. And that the, while they do have a shock value, that there are perhaps more nuanced ways of approaching this issue that doesn't doesn't focus on the sensationalization, but in fact focuses, I suppose, more on more on education. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that idea of maybe not using the scientific numbers, the shock factor so much? Sure. Well, I guess I'll just start by saying I really uh, sympathize with, um, you know, climate activists and also um, people who have been struggling for a long time to galvanize action around climate issues. And um, it's just this painstaking, slow moving process with, you know, that hasn't yielded a lot of progress. And so, of course, you know, we are trying, you know, what what um, those what people who are activists and advocates and even some climate agencies, you know, if they're trying to urge action, it helps to have a figure to pull out to say, hey, like this, this is what we could, this is our a projection that, that could happen, you know, and, and there's definitely use in trying to use numbers to prepare for the future. So I'll just lay that down right away. But also, um, I think that um, there, you know, for a long time, you know, that you mentioned the scientific numbers for a long time, the numbers that were thrown around were not scientific, they were, you know, as as the folks in that I talked to said back of the envelope math, um, you know, just sort of guessing or, or saying, Oh, well, all of the people here are going to be affected by climate change. So they're all potential refugees, you know, or they're all potential climate migrants, which is, you know, super broad brush. And, um, and so until very recently, we had sort of unscientific estimates and they did lend themselves to this sort of invasion mindset mentality. I mean, they're, you know, we're talking about, you know, media representation of migrants uh, today. And one of the, you know, I'm, I was kind of pulling together some examples of the ways that, you know, even well-meaning progressive um, people and institutions have really tried to um, have used sort of the, the specter of environmental uh, refugees to try to drum up support for climate action. And it, 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 it veers into xenophobic territory. Um, you know, the Nobel Committee, when it awarded its prize to Al Gore, talked about the danger of climate refugees, um, the you know lawmakers who were trying to drum up support for the Waxman-Markey climate bill, the, one of the first big attempts at climate legislation here in the US. Um, even, you know, and this is all actually research that I pulled from Elizabeth Hartman's great book, The America Syndrome. So if anyone's interested in these things, look at that book. Um, and then even, you know, she found in her research, the Pew, um, 
charitable trusts, they had a initiative back in the 90s that was looking at population issues. And, you know, their researchers suggested that we, you know, we use the, um, the unfortunately, the specter of environmental refugees driven by scarcity, um, you know, to American borders may be necessary to build public support for uh, increases in funding. So, I mean, they, they were, you know, so and all of these things were, you know, filtered down to media representations of, of climate migrants. And, and with the Pew example, that's, you know, that was meant to specifically influence um, media coverage. So, um, you know, uh, so when we're thinking about uh, those kinds of things, we need to be really careful about the numbers that we that we throw out there and um, and they should be careful estimates and they should be scientific and um, you know there was a uh, World Bank report in 2018 that came up with the first sort of grounded methodologically sound number and it looked specifically at internal migration you know again I, I return to that again and again because so much climate migration is internal within country borders not across them and um, you know so I really connected with what, what Sarah was saying, you know, about sort of challenging this narrative of huge waves that kick off all of a sudden and that we are going to have a billion climate refugees, by the way, there's no such thing as a climate refugee uh, um, in, in, uh, in the in, in international parlance. But um, but, you know, it's if that's not it's more complicated than that. It's, you know, a lot of migrants tend to adapt and adapt over years and move slowly uh, over time and, you know, um, before then it finally, you know, they finally make a move. And sometimes that move won't be very far. And sometimes that move is within their own country. And so um, we have to really, I think, challenge the way we think of climate migration because it can get us to a place where we're thinking about, oh, this is, you know, obviously we don't want people uprooted from their homes, but a certain amount of that is, is locked in. We are going to see people uprooted from their homes. And so we can't be thinking about it as this um, terrible um, thing that's going to happen all of a sudden and, and be such a devastating thing, you know, um, uh, you know, and this, this happens today. I mean, I was giving examples from the early 2000s, uh, but, you know, there was just a, a piece in the New Republic that I just always kind of returned to last year. It's a left-leaning magazine here in the U.S., um, and they had this, uh, they were talking, it was a piece about eco-fascists and uh, the piece, you know, it ended up saying that um, when it came to mass climate migration, at least the eco-fascists and nationalists are being realistic about the future. <laughs> um, you know, so if we're, it, that just shows how easy it is for even really well-meaning people who want to be prepared, who are trying to, um, you know, catalyze action for climate change um, can end up unintentionally playing into some really xenophobic thinking and um, and just uh, and create and creating more problems than, than, than they're solving. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that. And I also feel I want to come back in a minute to what you were saying, two points about the internal migration and the focus on the fact that people are moving within their countries as opposed to going abroad, and also the, the parlance, the climate refugee term, and it not really existing in official language. But um, Sarah, first, I wanted to come back to a point that Abram raised when he was speaking about negative perceptions of migrants, which is not just connected to climate, it's, it's connected to the whole debate and discussion around about migration. I mean, um, it doesn't help when you've got someone like Trump sitting in the White House who, who who is encouraging this kind of language. And I mean, Boris Johnson in the UK, but it's it is something that's become increasingly common. This negative perception of all migrants are here to to take away our social welfare, to take away our supports. All these kind of ideas that I see on the front of newspapers, like the newspaper that my neighbor across the road buys every day and I see him looking at it and I think, why are you buying that paper? It's all lies. But I mean, you, what, what how can we deal with this? How can we change the perception, or not change is the wrong word, but just help guide the perception of why a person will migrant and migrate and the deep connection that ties into climate because actually climate plays a role in nearly all types of migration. It, a lot of it, whether it's conflict, uh, political instability at all, eventually leads back to a uh, drought or flood or something along those lines. So just, I suppose it's a big question, but negativity around uh, the constant perception, negative perception that seems to, seems to persevere. Yeah, I think I, I think like climate change is perhaps the number one uh, issue on which the media have the opportunity to shift the narrative. 
from the problem to the solution and what we could do to actually find a solution and uh, to act actually. And so I, I think here we should suggest solution. We, we should try to fairly represent displacement in the context of climate change, but also try to avoid the fabrication of this migration threat or this apocalypses that we were just talking with Alexandra. Like media should suggest solution in the sense that uh, again, uh, when we talk about these numbers, when we talk about this prediction, uh, they serve poli policy makers as, as they tend to focus too much on preventing because they have to find solution to stop the inflow, they have to manage, they have to making us thinking that we are safe and we are protected and our border are, uh, are intangible. But again, I think all these predictions are, are basically full of crap. I mean, fairly, they are crude approaches of, okay, like, oh, West Africa is going to be affected by climate change. So uh, yeah, everybody living in West Africa will, will probably get out and, uh, and come to Europe. No, I think like we shouldn't avoid the fact that yes, people are right now leaving their home to the impact of climate change, conflict and, and so on, but the hyper focus on this, um, without nailing down this global uh, dynamic um, will not help. So again, if we look, for example, the recent uh, Reuters digital news report, they find out that negativity was one of the top reasons audience avoided the news. So again, rather than in reinforce this news fatigue or, or, or like we should propose solution, we should propose like sh shifting really the balance by promoting a forward looking or, you know, like coverage of responses to social problems, um, community cohesion, movement and cross border lesson, you know, traditional knowledge that can lead to new uh, technology that can born and, and so on. So again, I, I believe that um, if we focus on this um, on this, we also try to, to get into the, the, the discussion of representation and why we, uh, we just need to go behind this number and, and go into a deeply political nature of, of displacement. And that's why I believe it's important here to, you know, to, to challenge the, the surface uh, of this problem. Um, and again, try to, um, for example, I remember a few years ago, I was in Chad for an assignment with Doctors Without Border. And uh, Lake Chad is, uh, yeah, it's a huge lake that uh, in, the, in the last 60 years lost 90% of its surface due to largely, you know, unsustainable water management, also due to climate change. It's a natural catastrophe as dire consequences for a region where 30 million people are living. Um, but then again, uh, this is not just because of climate change. Uh, there is issue related to violence, violent conflict, and already a fragile situation in, in this region. So again, if we look at the, at, for example, the Boko Haram emergence in the area or uh, the, the scarcity of local resources, that again has been as exacerbated by the desertification, but we we see that these million people that are displaced or that they are living in a in a region that is the epicenter of a conflict and and poverty. Um, there is also a responsibility there, responsibility that is played by government, that is placed by international organization, and uh, and that's why I talk about the political root of displacement. And I think there is often a wide gap between this idea of uh, the climate refugees, also called climate refugees, and the reality on the ground. And, and that's why if we just focus on the climate without, it, and we ignore the fact that there are also other factors that are playing a role in that, including government responsibility, you know, to address this issue, then we, we are not taking into consideration people resilience or environmental adversity or other factors, you know, that might play a role and are important in our, uh, in our reporting. I keep, I keep forgetting to turn my mute off. And thanks, Sarah, for that. There was something you said right at the beginning that really struck me, stuck with me was, is that uh, migration, should be the key to shifting the narrative around sorry sorry climate should be the key to shifting the narrative around migration and explaining it to people and um, and i know there is a lot of confusion around uh what 
climate migration means. And I want to jump back to something that we touched on earlier. And Avram, I want to ask you about internal migration, because you touched on this as well. Alexander mentioned it, but you touched on it in your work as well, that it, it people don't want to leave their homes and go far, far away. It's 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 a step by step process that, that, that they start by just taking a few steps and going maybe to the next town and then going to the next city. And only then, and you, you, this is clear from your piece in the New York Times magazine that only then will they consider starting to cross borders and how do we as media professionals as people within the media um, make that clear to people that this narrative that you've got millions of people crossing border borders without even a moment's thought and just streaming across walls or whatever it is that's been put up to prevent them from entering how do you educate I suppose the truth of it that people in fact want to stay close to their homes yeah um I mean it's a great question I think you're getting a sense I'm nodding like crazy as as uh Alexandra and Sarah are talking it's um uh you're getting a sense of how intertwined all of these issues are and immensely complex uh you know what we're talking about is and um you know, one of the results of one of one of the things that that reflects is that the climate is, you know, rarely, if ever, you know, the sole cause of migration. Uh, it's usually an influence in some way, and and it's an influence among so many others, whether that's, you know, violence or uh, gang violence or crime or uh, or economic opportunity and and all of these things. Um, and um, so. So first of all, you know, recognizing that that climate is, uh, you know, is a subtle influence, and looking for that signal and and keeping that signal in context, I think helps to, um, you know, to frame all of the issues that we're talking about. And in terms of, you know, what people's actual uh, that that uh, inertia that you described, I mean, this idea that people don't want to move. Um, uh, you know that that's that is the case is that you know the human nature um for for most people is going to be to stay close to family stay close to community uh stay close to places that they know and are, and are attached to and um you know and i think around the world um uh, in the you know in the majority of my reading and research um people are are reticent to make that large change and so you know it's our um uh it is part of our responsibility covering this issue to, you know, to, to keep people's movements in that context. And that's a little bit of, you know, a flow against, you know, the narrative of, you know, the, the invasion narrative that, that we're talking about, that people are just, you know, ready to, to um, you know, jump ship and, uh, you know, and flow across the border into the United States or flow across, you know, the Mediterranean into, into Europe. Um, so I think storytelling about individual lives and again, you know, sort of that empathy uh, effort that I talked about before is, is one way to do that is to, is to, you know, bring, bring people into uh, potential migrants decision making and their experience and, and help people connect with, um, you know, what the various pulls and pushes are for individual decision making. I mean, all these big numbers, the thousands of people that come across the U.S. border into Texas every year, they're, they're collections of many, many individual people. And, um, you know, to the extent that we can keep going back to that, uh, to how, you know, individual um, men and women and children are, you know, are torn away from their families or face decisions about their crops or, uh, face, you know, a, an opportunity to make some more money. I think that helps to just personalize, um, the, you know, this issue. Uh, and it also, you know, is a, is a reminder that there's, um, there's other ways to address this challenge, this problem, if you, if you want to call it that, and that some of those are, you know, um, policies that can aid people in the places where they are. So, you know, we often talk about, um, you know, climate and migration and immigration as, um, you know, uh, influxes to be dealt with, uh, you know, on the receiving end. Um, but there is so much to be done um, that's extremely effective on the origin end. And, uh, you know, that can range from, um, you know, uh, foreign aid, agricultural aid. I spent a lot of time in my reporting, you know, with the World Food Program in Central America and found um, just extraordinarily effective programs that don't require a lot of investment um, that, you uh, you know, change, uh, you know, an individual farmer or village's calculus about the challenges that they face and tap right into this idea um, that people prefer not to move if they have another option. And so, you know, in one case in El Salvador, a $30,000 investment created a plastic greenhouse that held enough moisture for crops that were drying up otherwise to grow. And that was enough 
for an entire village that was ready to, you know, pay a pay a coyote to smuggle them into the United States to decide to stay instead. And, um, you know, so if you can understand that dynamic that, you know, that many, many people would prefer to work out the challenges in their individual lives um, as they are and in place, uh, and then you're willing to make the policies or investments to do that, that can be extraordinarily effective. And, you know, and one of our roles is, um, you know, as Sarah said, is to, you know, incur at least illuminate what those policy options are and, um, and maybe to encourage them, uh, you know, to support, um, criticism about them when it comes out, you know, that in the United States, the GAO recently came out with a report that, that criticized, you know, the Trump administration's um, cancellation of, of a lot of foreign aid uh, that, you know, would have a direct impact on the kind of program I described in El Salvador. And that's the kind of report that no one pays any attention to and mostly goes unnoticed. And that's an opportunity for us in, in covering this issue to, you know, to highlight that aspect um, of the problem. Um, I just want to say one other thing that kind of goes back to what we were talking about before, but just, you know, I keep thinking about the scale of this and it is correct. It's very difficult to put numbers uh, on the number of people that will move and um, it can be very problematic to talk about things this way. Um, but there is also just an undeniable challenge and I think the enormity of it needs to be realized and there are unfortunately negative aspects of that that can't all be sort of packaged and, and um, you know, and tidied up and, you know, so if you just look at the ecological change around the world uh, and you don't try to imagine how many people will move in response to it, but you just look at how many people will find themselves in increasingly challenging environments, um, the numbers are just huge, you know, maybe, maybe a third of the global population in the future. And that is so many orders of magnitude larger than the number of people that have faced environmental challenge in the past. Uh, that it simply means that, you know, that inevitably in some shape or form that we might not be able to completely anticipate or accurately describe yet, um, there is going to be transformative change and a lot of destabilization that results from it. And um, uh, it can't all be, you know, packaged up in, you know, in kind of, uh, you know, in upbeat stories um, and pretty pictures. I think that, uh, that it is important to try to um, you know, understand this, the scale of change that's coming and that's going to provoke some, some negative responses and, and also some opportunity, but we have to look at that whole big picture. Great. Thanks, Abram. I'm, I'm conscious. I've just noticed the time and I'm conscious that we actually have quite a few questions coming in um, from people. So I'll try and get through a few of them. Um, I, I, there's one here from Pauline, which says, how important is it to have international legal recognition of climate migrants as a particular category. I know we've touched on this already, but just, I mean, I suppose international law around recognizing the rights of climate migrants and that kind of feeds into what Alexander mentioned earlier about the fact that there's no actual uh, official recognition of the term climate refugee. So whoever wants to jump in on that. Sorry, um, I can um, go into a little bit more about it. Um, the, you know, there are, I think among experts who study environmental migration and who are at the UN climate talks every year and, you know, folks who, um, you know, are uh, kind of represent a, a spectrum of positions, but a, but a lot of them say we're nowhere near having a special designation for climate refugees, um, and uh, and we may not ever get there. And one of and there's a couple of reasons that um, you know that they point to. One is um, that it's very hard to, as you know, we've kind of touched on in this conversation, to um, determine who. Uh, who exactly is a climate refugee? You know, so you could say that uh, you know a farmer who who you know whose land is ravaged by drought and has to leave. You could you could say that they were a climate refugee, but you could also say they were an economic refugee. You know, um, economic migrant. Um, so uh, these things are very tied up, and it's not always clear cut. And we're all impacted by our environments. So um, you know, it's 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 hard to make a determination. Where's the cutoff line? Um, and then, you know, there's a, another thing is that, you know, most of the places that host refugee, you know, designating a certain group of people climate refugees doesn't mean that all of a sudden um, uh, developed nations with the capacity to take refugees are going to open their doors and say, okay, come here, you're climate refugees, because a lot of the 
you know, nations that host uh, refugees of all kinds um, are, you know, already have take on most of that, uh, most of those people. So it's, you know, they're going to be going to the same places, whether we, um, unfortunately, I mean, there's a lot of places that just don't have their doors open. So they'll be going to the same places, whether or not they're designated a climate refugee or an economic refugee or, a, uh, you know, somebody who uh, was affected by war and violence and conflict. Um, so uh, I think that those are a couple of things that people point to as reasons why we don't have an official designation. And, um, you know, and, and then there are some, su some suggestions for ways that we could work around that. And people do point to, um, you know, sort of regional um, agreements between countries that are kind of close to each other, um, you know, visa programs where, uh, <coughs> excuse me, where people agree to take on you know, uh, a certain amount of people from this country, uh, you know, for, you know, are they open them, uh, they open the, their doors for a specific reason, you know, um, so I think there's, there's options out there, but I think the the designation isn't, is not, is not there yet. Okay, thanks, Alexandra. Um, and another question coming in here, whether journalists covering, um, climate migration um, receive a uh, negative reaction or pushback from public and I'd also add to that question myself how do you find and this is because I'm conscious there's a lot of student journalists listening in how do you find pitching these kind of pieces to editors and um, is the interest have you seen the interest grow and develop over recent years as compared to maybe four years ago when you went and you said you had a piece about um, climate migration in Central America and um, so yeah to the 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 professional editorial interest and then the public response to the type of work that, that you do? I can tackle public response a little bit and just, you know, um, describe, I mean, some of the feedback, I'd say overwhelmingly the feedback I've gotten to the, to the reporting I've done recently has been um, positive, has been, uh, you know, a great deal of empathy and sort of eye-opening and um, enormous interest uh, and uh, and curiosity about, you know, how this issue of climate that, it, you know, is new, unfortunately, to, to too many people uh, also intersects with this with this issue of migration. So so mostly positive. But, um, you know, as we, we've talked about sort of the dangers of, of a xenophobic response and sort of the nationalistic provocation, and that comes through as well. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting to see uh, whose buttons are pushed um, on this issue, you know, in the United States, I've gotten um, a lot of feedback uh, and, you know, seeming support for the reporting, but from very conservative circles. And, you know, it, they see this issue as, um, you know, validation of their border concerns or their immigration control concerns, uh, which I think is unfortunate. Um, but a lot of people sort of see in it what they need to see. And, you know, and that's a risk. And the other issue that comes up repeatedly, um, you know, and needs to be addressed more, at least than I have personally in, in my work yet is, you know, is this issue of overpopulation um, or population growth around around the world, which is kind of inextricably linked, but is a real um, danger zone in the conversation because uh, it is often, you know, it's a very loaded term and a loaded argument. And, and I find that a, a lot of the feedback that I get, you know, encouraging um, me to look at uh, population growth as a, as a cause is, uh, you know, is kind of motivated by, um, you know, bias and, and xenophobia and not a real interest in the issue. Uh, so I think that's a challenge, you know, for how to how to look at migration in the context of rapid population growth without, um, you know, kind of provoking uh, that that worst reaction to it. Um, but it but the, the the reporting brings out that in in people, I, I hear more about those issues and that argument um, than I ever have in anything else I've reported on. I think that's a very good point to make about the kind of um, the care that you have to take as a journalist when reporting on anything to do with migration as to how um, how it's interpreted and particularly around headlines and subheads and I know I, am, I don't write my own headlines unfortunately sometimes I write something and a headline totally out of context appears on top of it and um, but I think so it's something at editorial level as well that and um, the conversation around climate and, as you said, population growth as well, even though you're doing it to educate people, it can be, it can be taken and used in a very, I suppose, negative and um, skewed way to, to push back against, against uh, the movement of humans. And um, there was another thing that you mentioned there, which was um, 
the validation of you said some of the people who get in touch because it kind of validated their concerns that they have around borders you talking about the fact that there's people that have that climate is creating this emergency and people have to leave sarah and this is obviously something that's very present on the mediterranean i mean we have people from many countries around the world crossing into um into greece and into italy and into spain but um and migrant is at the root of many of those although as, as we've already discussed it's a multifaceted um issue it's a multifaceted um playing field when it comes to someone choosing to up, to move their life to a totally different place how as journalists should we be careful when it comes to <laughs> avoiding validating the concern of a person in sitting in Birmingham who reads a piece about a person in Chad who has lost everything and will have to leave because of drought um, and then says, OK, well, now I should close my borders because everyone from Chad's going to turn up on my doorstep. Yeah, uh, I would like to make a few points here. Uh, I think like we should think in a way to a strategy how to debunk this uh, climate migration myth. Like try to maybe have a kind of, uh, you know, as a journalist uh, checklist that we should uh, we should try to, to go through and to be sure that in our reporting uh, there is enough um, to, to, to convince the, the reader uh, that this is not just uh, migration driven, that like that the migration is driven by so many factors and uh, rarely we can reduce this to the fact of, uh, you know, the, 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 the climate change or uh, other environmental factors. So in a way, I think uh, it's important not to blame the climate, right? And, uh, and to say like, okay, this, there is not just a, simple, a simplistic view, as you said, but uh, we need to think that this narrative um, may also uh, become a strategy, you know, to, to, to remove the political dimension from the social issue again. Uh, so, for example, if political issues are affecting that vulnerable population um, and their resilience uh, is there because they are trying to cope with this environmental uh, struggle, uh, or, or then we should try to highlight this, for example. For instance, let's say um, Sudan. Communities there are, are currently experiencing a like unprecedented level of um, and floating and uh, like climate extremes are, are taking place within a context that is already very fragile and there is a political insecurity and the, the, the security environment there is, is problematic. So I think it's important to consider all this element and then when we tell about you know the communal conflict that are uh, are happening in Darfur, we should also explain that this is because there is a competition over natural resources and this boat of you know seasonal migration uh, climate condition, but also uh, the fact that the government of Sudan has not been addressing this issue for so long. So the idea that politicians often try to depoliticize this issue um, and they are shifting the blame to, to the environmental or the climate for factors there that is like behind their control. And uh, like, for instance, in Morocco, um, politicians are often invoking uh, the idea of desertification, you know, to, to, to explain that they can cannot really find a solution for the, the migration from rural area to urban area uh, or, you know, the low productivity or the economic stagnation and things like that. So, I mean, this crisis narrative um, of climate change, of desertification, of conflict, I think has also create a sense of fatigue and have been, you know, used to, to, uh, to justify certain policy that have maybe marginalized certain group or, you know, if we go to, to, the, to Sudan, for example, they have been marginalized nomadic group, uh, forcing them to settle down. And so like it's convenient for government, right, to use this climate as an excuse sometimes also to displace people. Um, for instance, like in the Pacific Island, um, like there are a lot of example, I think, that we could uh, we could use in our reporting that uh, you know could help us to to explain that the the reason behind is not just about you know access to resources but is is more complex and it's not just about okay the sea level is rising so all the population in bangladesh will be at risk um so I think, yeah, we really need to, to look at what are the real root behind the, the displacement and the, the social issue that are the main causes of this crisis. 
Great, thanks, Sarah. Now you made some really good points there that it's extremely important to, to remember the, the, the many um, elements that um, feed into migration, as you said, the political factors that, that politicians' reliance sometimes on the climate excuse isn't good enough. Um, I'm looking at the time now, so I'm just gonna put a final question to all three of you, if you wanna give it a kind of a short enough answer, because we're speaking to students of journal, or to students who are interested, might be interested in journalism. Um, what would be your advice to someone who is interested in a topic like climate or migration or climate migration, the two, when it comes to tackling something that is very sensitive and very um, emotive, that it, it drives, people's uh, emotions when they're reading this content that they often would respond quite sometimes aggressively sometimes emotionally and um, someone who's starting out what would be your advice i put it to all three of you maybe abram if you want to go first sure i mean i i think um it sort of the answer summarizes what we've just been talking about but i think the best thing you can do is to step back and be aware of what some of those uh negative repercussions could be uh what the pitfalls are the counter arguments the the worst reactions that you might receive and um i don't think everybody has a responsibility to address them directly or make an argument about them but uh, at least to let them inform um, you know, what you do write and report and, uh, you know, to have in the back of your mind uh, that how you present things should, you know, should address or, or counter, um, you know, those worst arguments or just anticipate them a little bit. I think that that's, you know, the, the best that we can do, but, um, but should always be uh, in, you know, in mind. Thanks, Abram. Uh, Alexandra? Um, sure. I guess um, I, I think two two main things. One is, um, you know, how, you know, what is, first I think is the most important is to get on the ground, um, go to the places that are responding to climate change impacts, um, really find out how are these communities responding? How many tries at adaptation did they make? You know, how, where are they going actually? Um, you know, and then when we do that kind of reporting, we can add nuance to the discussion. We can ground things like numbers, which I agree with Abram are very very important and I don't want to dismiss that um, you know but when as long as the numbers are scientific it's, it is also a, helpful to have um, that sort of on the ground picture of what is actually unfolding because we tend to otherwise make a lot of assumptions and things are just a lot more nuanced and a lot more complicated than they seem especially when it comes to migration as we've discussed today so that's my main that's my main advice is, is get on the ground. Thanks, Alexandra. And finally, Sarah. I think like uh, we should we should remember that displacement is happening uh, all around the world and not only in the Sahel or somewhere far away. And the same thing is for climate change. So it's also happening on our step door in our countries, in our cities in Europe or, or in the US. So we don't need to go that far, you know, uh, it could be really just a few kilometers away from your house and, uh, and definitely is important to, 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 to be there and to listen to, to those activists, to those, you know, uh, communities that are finding solution. That's why I was uh, insisting on solution journalism and trying to shift the balance, you know, by promoting this uh, forward looking uh, coverage uh, that provide responses to, to, to problems, social problem and, and so on. And I think, uh, yeah, it's important to, to highlight the way people around the world are, are responding to this problem, but also we, we need to be extremely cautious on the world and the image that we use. Uh, especially when we are representing uh, vulnerable population or distant others. Uh, um, so, and then to finish, I think again, um, if people are displaced or die as a result of natural disaster, this is not just a direct consequences of the disaster, but also it, it represents the inability of the government to help those people to cope with such stress, uh, you know, building uh, flood defenses or having an evacuation plan uh, that could timely be in uh, use and building regulation and so on. So really our role as journalists is to, to dig into those uh, elements and um, yeah, and ask politicians and, uh, and people that are in power how they're going to respond to this. 
Yeah, they're all brilliant points. I mean, yes, holding uh, those in power to account and speaking truth to power is always the number one role of a journalist. And also, I think taking caution with words and images is also something we should all take responsibility for. Um, Abern, you mentioned also taking care and note of what we're writing, that it's, I mean, obviously you're conscious of what you're writing, but actually sometimes stepping back and trying to look at it through different eyes is very important to perhaps... Um, pick out issues that might be taken out of context. And then also, Alexander, I totally agree on the ground. It's the only way really, it's the only, unfortunately with COVID, it's restricting us a lot in how much we can do it. But with journalism, there's no doubt about it that when you meet a person face to face, no Zoom call will ever um, suffice when it comes to, I, I find from my own work that it is, it's not the same. You can't interact in the way, you'll not fully understand as a journalist what a person is saying on the same level if you don't meet them in person. So that is always, and once we get through this horrible world we're living in, hopefully we'll be back doing that again soon. Um, so I'll pass you back to, I just wanna say a huge thank you actually to all our speakers. I've really enjoyed tonight's discussion and one hour goes by way too quickly. Um, I'd Highly recommend everyone who's tuned in to follow the work of these three amazing journalists. Um, they are all playing very important roles in educating people in, within their own countries and internationally on um, issues connected to migration and climate. Um, and um, a thanks to Stand for holding the event as well. So I'll pass you back to Joanne now. Thank you, Circa. And just to echo, I suppose, Circa, what you've, what you've said, just a big thank you to our three speakers. It was really incredible. It was a really incredible conversation and I could have listened for hours uh, longer, uh, but unfortunately time ran away with us. But thank you so much for taking your time to be with us here tonight. And I think it was a really empowering conversation as well. And I think will be very useful for the attendees uh, here tonight. Um, and a big thank you as well to Circa for doing an incredible job on, on leading the discussion. So thank you for joining us as well. And then obviously to our audience, I know everyone is very busy with college life right now and, and the in, imminent lockdown that we're facing here in Ireland. So I do appreciate people taking the time to attend uh, this evening. I left a link in the um, in the chat box there, we have three more days of events happening, so feel free to check out some more events if you're interested. Um, but other than that, I hope everybody has a lovely evening and thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. Um, and actually, Alexander and Abraham, I know it's morning time there, so I hope you have a lovely day. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, and have a good night. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.